Create is one of the biggest mods ever made for Minecraft, and so naturally one question I get all the time is where do I start and what do I need to know? So I thought I would compile a list of 10 things that you just absolutely need to know in order to get into the Create mod. And you and I can't be friends if uh, this is not the absolute best way to transport your items. I mean, come on, it's perfect. I don't want to see anyone playing Create and not using toolboxes. Except for all the times that I don't use toolboxes. That, that That's a pass, okay? I, I, I get a pass on that. Okay, nope. Oh, there we go. Oh, it has knockback. I didn't, I, I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it had knock. Wait, what? Whoa. Oh, I'm starting to see it. I didn't know you could do that. Okay, yes. I love discovering things while recording a video. Sheep, you're messing with my symmetry, man. This first tip, I see so many experienced players and even more beginner players get it wrong, and it is what are stress units and rotations per minute. So observe this expertly built windmill. When we investigate it while wearing goggles on our head, we can see it's producing 2048 stress units, or SU. We can also see on this speedometer that it's rotating at four rotations per minute, or four RPM. And I'm gonna be using SU and RPM for the rest of the video. So what does this mean? And how are these related to each other? Well, interestingly, they're not, right? This is producing 2048 stress units, which is a measure of capacity, right? Think of it as your energy that you can use for your machines. The RPM that is produced by this windmill is just the RPM that it's spinning at, and the stress units is just the stress units it produces. This number will never change, but RPM can by means of speeding it up or slowing it down. So stress units is a static number. A windmill of this size will always produce 2048 stress units and there is nothing you can do to it to make it produce less or more. Just like this water wheel here will always produce 256 stress units. There is no way for it to make more or less. RPM is a measure of how fast your components are moving, like your shafts or your cogs or your encased fans or other machines, right? And this is something that you can change and is not tied to its generator. Each generator has a base RPM, right? Because you can't have RPM without a generator. Uh, however, it's something that's totally malleable and we'll talk about a little bit later. Now that you know what RPM and stress units are, let's talk about how to calculate how many stress units you need. And to do that, you're gonna need to be wearing goggles like I am and then hover over whatever machine or stress unit consuming item you want. And you can see at the bottom, it tells you a little bit of an equation. It has some number times RPM, okay? And we're gonna call that number the impact value. And as the impact value goes up, you can see the colors of the little equation changes to show you how much stress impact it has. An impact value of eight consumes much more stress units than an impact value of two. And this is really easy. What this means is an encased fan consumes two times RPM stress units. This consumes four times RPM stress units, and this consumes eight times RPM stress units. So for a little bit of math, if I were to put an encased fan on a speed of 16 RPM, it would consume 32 stress units. If I take a mechanical drill and put it on an RPM of 32, it consumes 128 stress units, and if I take 128 RPM and slap it on the mechanical press, you can see we consume 1,024 stress units. Of course, the math being 8 times 128, 4 times 32, and 2 times 16. So the amount of stress units consumed is proportional to RPM, but remember, the stress of the machines that power these does not change. This brings up an interesting math equation about stress impact. Consider your small and large water wheels. The small water wheel produces 256 stress units at a speed of 8 RPM, and the large water wheel produces 512 stress units at a speed of 4 RPM. Is there a better option for the most amount of stress units between these two? If you said the large water wheel, you would be correct, because remember, RPM can go up and down however you'd like, but stress units are static, meaning if we were to double the speed of this large water wheel and bring it to 8 RPM, machines would consume just as much stress on the, on the small water wheel as they would the large water wheel, but there would be more stress units available. Just to prove my point, I'll go and double the speed of the large water wheel through a gear ratio and show you that a mechanical press consumes 64 
stress units, and it consumes 64 stress units on a small water wheel. So small water wheels are actually kind of useless because these guys are just simply more stress units for a relatively small cost. Now, for those of you who are wondering gear ratio, what's that? Well, this third tip is for you and, of course, everyone else, which is how do you make more RPM? We know that stress units are static, but RPM is malleable. Well, how do we change it? For this example, I'm going to be using a creative motor spinning at 16 RPM, which you can confirm with your speedometer. And the first method of increasing RPM is called the gear ratio. You start with a large cog wheel connected to your source of RPM, and then connect a small cog wheel to its diagonal. And you can see if I place a large cog wheel on this one, it's clearly spinning faster. In fact, it's spinning at double the speed. Now you can even continue this gear ratio by placing another small cogwheel diagonal to this one but you'll notice it won't let you do that the cogwheel just pops off and that's because there would be a speed conflict okay two different rpms can connect to each other however if i were to place a small cogwheel right here this big cogwheel would double its speed speeding up this cogwheel speeding up this cogwheel speeding up the large cogwheel and then speeding up the small cogwheel again and that would be an infinite speed loop so you can't do that what you can do is encase this cogwheel here blocking its shaft and allowing you to place another small cogwheel in the correct position doubling the speed again so we've gone from 16 to 32 and now to 64. another way to produce this effect is actually with something called the adjustable chain gear shift and it's especially helpful if you're using chain drives as long as your adjustable chain gear shift is the receiving chain drive for your rpm if you power it you'll notice that all the other chain drives in the network get their speed doubled. So this is another really convenient and interesting way to double your speed. It's also toggleable if you'd like that. Of course, one of the premier ways to produce RPM is the rotation speed controller, although you can see through its recipe, it's a bit of a late game thing. Still, it's the precisest way to change your RPM. You slap a cogwheel on top of it, and if you input through the shaft, you can actually move the RPM up to a very specific number and watch as the cogwheel changes speed. Fun fact, you can actually power the cog wheel at the slower or faster speed and then change the speed on the shaft input as well if you want to do it that way. Another interesting way to increase your RPM is by connecting it to a faster source of RPM, okay? So if I have two sources of RPM, right, both going at 16 RPM, the cogs spin at 16 RPM. But if I pull this up to 98 RPM, you'll notice all the cogs, even the one attached to the slower source, speed up. That's because in a network of RPM, it will adhere to the fastest source. And finally, kind of a weird way to do it, you can actually use a sequence gear shift to double its input speed, but uh, we're not really covering these in this video, so I'm just going to move on from that. So if you've made it this far in the video, you now know the absolute basics of stress units and RPM and how to manipulate your machines and make sure you've got enough going on. You might also consider subscribing to the channel in order to get updates on my guides and let's play videos. But now you are excited to get into the nitty gritty. It's time to start placing some blocks and quite literally, that's what this tip is about, how to place them. Because there's a few tools that Create actually gives you to make your life even easier. Take the saw, for example. When you place it down, it's always going to be facing you, but there are times where you'd like a saw, well, not to be. You just have to shift right click. That's right. If you shift right click blocks onto the ground, they will face away from you. The same thing can be observed when working with a deployer. The deployer will always face you when you place it onto the ground, but shift right click and it will face away from you, even downwards. Sometimes you want blocks to go on top of depots, and if you just right click a depot, well, it's going to put that block onto it. And instead of having to build up an annoying pillar and slap your blocks down like that, shift right clicking is again your friend. All you have to do is shift right click the block and it'll even place it in the proper spot, and if it's directional, it'll place it facing in the proper direction. Now let's say you've placed your blocks, but they're in the wrong rotation, right? We want these shafts to be facing into each other. Well, you can actually use a wrench to rotate placed down 
blocks. You can even use a wrench to turn a standard gearbox into a vertical one without having to craft it and spin it around itself. And you'll notice that the face of the block that you're looking at is the axis of rotation, right? So I'm going to look at the top of this block and you'll notice it rotates around its top. So if I wanted to turn it back into a regular gearbox, we could rotate it around its side like that. Same thing here. I can spin the shaft input around this deployer by looking at its top, but I could also spin the deployer around like this by looking at its side and shift right click a block with your wrench and it will instantly destroy it and in survival mode it will place it in your inventory though this only works on crate mod components you can't like suck up dirt immediately it would just be too op so you can move things you can place things down and you can make them spin but what do you make and how do you even make them well that's where a second mod comes into play it's something you should really always have when doing anything in mod in minecraft especially if you're making your own pack jei there's a little menu on the side that gives you an overview of every single block in the game it is an amazing tool and there's a little bit of nuance to reading it when it comes to the create mod so i'm gonna go over a few examples with you guys Let's take a look at andesite casing, okay? You don't craft this normally, right? You can see that this is a JEI screen for the create mod. It's super interactive. This is a deploying one, right? It depicts a deployer deploying andesite alloy onto any stripped log and it turns it into andesite casing. You can also see there's a manual item application. This depicts placing down any type of vanilla stripped log and right clicking it with an andesite alloy to create andesite casing. You can also see in the oak's plank menu, sawing. This just depicts taking a stripped oak log, placing it onto an upwards facing saw, and it will produce six oak planks. There's a ton of different ones, but they're all pretty self-explanatory. The one I want to go through is sequential crafting. This can be a little bit confusing to new people, but essentially what it's telling you to do is to deploy a cog wheel, a large cog wheel, and an iron nugget in that order onto a gold sheet five times for an 80% chance to get a precision mechanism and a 20% chance to get some salvage of the process. Although depots are on the underside of the deployers, you can use belts or any other depot-like block to do this deploying sequence. So that's what a recipe sequence looks like, and if you're playing create mod packs, you're definitely going to be needing to read a ton of those. Another thing that's in the menus but not JEI that is so insanely useful that you can use JEI for is the ponder menu, okay? Any machine you see, hold W to ponder, well, hold W to ponder, and it will bring up a three-dimensional animated tutorial for you. It's incredibly good. It's an amazing way to learn the create mod and it's always there for you, right? No matter what you need, every single moving object, whoops, excuse me, every single moving object has a ponder menu. Just hit W and not the E key to close out your menu, okay? Just don't be like me, don't fat finger. But JEI and ponder will teach you how to craft and use just about every individual machine in the game. It's pretty amazing. Thank you to the Great Mod devs for including such an amazing resource and a JEI integration. Just insane. As you progress deeper into the Create Mod and explore as many facets, you are going to run into, eventually, a farm that you build that produces an infinite amount of items, like this cobblestone farm behind me. But what happens when it starts to fill up? How do you put an on and off switch onto your automatic machines? Well, this is a skill that's incredibly important because as you begin to generate more and more and more cobblestone, you'll notice that there will be a big buildup and on servers especially, but even large single player worlds, having tons of items building up right here is going to cause a lot of lag. So grab yourself a threshold switch and be amazed at the powers that be. A threshold switch attaches to any inventory and it will output a redstone signal when the percentage filled of the chest goes above whatever this number is. So the default setting is pretty good. When whatever inventory it's looking at reaches 76% or more capacity, it drops to this bar here, right? This little chest icon indicates the fill line. It will wait until it's 25% emptied to stop producing a redstone signal. So the default setting is pretty good for keeping your chest from getting entirely full. You can change these values by scrolling here and there, right? So if you want it to, to 
lock up at 75% full and then release at 50% full, you could do that and that can be your loop. Combine this with the clutch and a little bit of redstone and perhaps a redstone repeater and you have yourself a wonderful little off switch. What we're gonna do over here is disconnect the drill from this uh, water wheel here and move the system back one block so that the water wheel powers the clutch first. So with the water wheel now powering the clutch, we can take the redstone signal emitted by our threshold switch and run it all along right into the clutch and bam, the drill has stopped. That's because what a clutch does is it takes a redstone signal and locks any RPM passing through it. So even though we're producing stress and RPM, it's completely locked by this clutch. Once our chest reaches the desired fill level, the redstone signal stops the clutch opens up and your farm begins to process again so please 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 if you're playing on a server add this switch in right the closer we get to 75 the higher that little chest icon goes and once we pass that threshold boom the clutch locks right back up and you stop producing items and you don't create any nasty buildup so if that's a major tip that everyone needs to know make on and off switches they're super simple there are more complicated ways of doing these, but this is kind of a basic, more beginner video, so we're going to leave it at this. This next tip is especially important if you're playing in a mod pack that has different types of progression that makes brass harder to get, but use weighted ejectors, okay? Use them, all right? They're not just silly, fun little things. They are silly, they are fun, okay? And what they do is you can throw items on top of them and they will eject them. If you shift right click a block with a weighted ejector and then place it in line with that, any items that go onto this weighted ejector will be fired at that block and it's exactly accurate. So what makes them so good. Well, not only are they pretty fast to recharge at very high speeds, which as we know is not too hard to get our hands on, but you can filter with them. Yeah, you can tell a weighted ejector to eject a very specific amount of items. So we can tell it to eject 10 and uh, one item isn't enough, two items isn't enough. It's only 10 items that this thing will eject. Even if we put a stack of items on top of it, it will only eject 10 at a time. These things are masters at controlling item flow, okay? It's incredible what they can do. Another amazing feature of them is they can actually directly target storage devices uh, like this funnel or rather storage inputs and you can just make sure your items at a distance are placed right into your things. They save you a lot on having to make belts and there's a lot of visual lag that belts can do so weighted ejectors especially in the early game are amazing at splitting item stacks or waiting for a specific amount of things to be processed. Super super cool. And you and I can't be friends if uh, this is not the absolute best way to transport your items. I mean, come on, it's perfect. How could you ever want anything else? Look at it, look at it, look at it. I love them, they're so cute. They're adorable, they're the most, they're the, it confirmed, the cutest create mod component. Weighted ejectors, they're adorable. This next tip might be one of the most important. Toolboxes, use them. Toolboxes are these amazing little chests that can hold multiple stacks of an item, up to 256 of them. You can use them to store your create components or just anything that you would like. And if you hold down the Alt key, it will open up this little menu where you can mouse over what you want and while you're in range of the toolbox, place that item down. Here, let me go into survival mode to better show this. So in survival mode, you'll see that as I place down these cogs, my inventory is restocked straight out of the toolbox. Grass blocks, boom, restocked. Now you'll even see if you leave the range of your toolbox, that light goes off and you stop restocking. And once you enter back in, you gain the restock ability again. This is so useful, especially for building massive machines. You can have multiple toolboxes around. You can send your items back to your toolbox like that. It's so, so, so convenient. Convenient. You pick up toolboxes by just punching them. They're amazing. And even better, if you go into the create mod config, you can actually change how far they work. So in the config, go to gameplay settings and then find yourself the equipment page up here. And you can scroll on down to toolbox range and set that to whatever you want. So you could set toolbox to work 32 blocks away from you. Uh, make sure to save that and you'll see we can go far, 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 far away from our toolbox and still operate it. It's really cool. Just be warned the further away you are from your toolbox, the more likely you are to, you know, lose it forever.
don't do that. But these are absolutely life-changing and game-changing, not just for create engineers, but if you have the create mod and you want to do a build, they're so much better than shulker boxes because, like I said here, let me show you the multiple menu. If you have multiple different toolboxes down, you want to you want them to be different colors because you'll actually be able to see them as different colors come up. And you just click on them to open up their inventories. You can name them different things if you don't want them to be different colors and stuff. They're just they're too useful. They're too useful. I don't want to see anyone playing create and not using toolboxes, except for all the times that I don't use toolboxes. That that that's a pass. Okay, I I, I get a pass on that. This next tip has a lot to do with mindset, right? Because a lot of people get confused and daunted by creep because, I mean, at its core, it's a pretty intense automation mod with strange devices and weird mechanics. But remember, create builds off of the survival vanilla experience really, really well. If you want to make a tree farm, you have to rely on growing trees like normal. Same thing with the crop farm. And sometimes, you know, it's better not to automate something, but to find it in the world. Like if you need lots of water, well, connect to pump to a giant water source like this or the grand lava lakes in the nether if you need that as well. After all, the only way to farm cobblestone in the create mod is to use a cobblestone generator, so just remember to sometimes take a step back from your machines, right? Think about it as a Minecraft experience rather than some separate third-party mod. It's vanilla plus at its core. And always remember, create is about creativity and fun. So don't get caught up in efficiency or compactness. Do what you want, put that spaghetti belt line, destroy your SU, and have to make 100,000 windmills just to power it. Whatever powers your dreams, that's what create's all about. And this last tip is something that even I forget all the time, and it's to use the Create Vanilla Plus items, the stuff that's meant to augment your experience in the vanilla world. I forget these things all the time, like the Extendo Grip. Put it in your offhand and you have so much more range, like how far I can view that block. I can use it to place blocks, I can use it to break blocks, I think you can even use it to attack mobs at a huge distance. Let's see, can I punch this bee? Well, that was rude of the bee. How about this cow? Can I punch this cow from a super distance? Yeah, look at that. Look at look at the distance I can punch this cow. Eh, eh, okay, nope. Oh, there we go. Oh, it has knockback. I didn't. I, I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it had knockback. Like these things are so fun to play with, and I overlook them way too often. If you have yourself a regular diving helmet as well as a back tank, you'll actually gain water breathing and uh, look kind of freaky. Um, let me go into survival mode just to show this off, and you can see instead of my bubbles going away, we just have a timer in the bottom right next to our bubbles, and you can see we uh, can see very well in the uh, underwater area. Even cooler than that, though, is the netherite diving gear, which actually gives you lava immunity in addition to water breathing. So if I were to make ourselves a little pool of lava for our great, you know, Houdini magic trick, jump on into survival mode, we can just jump right into lava and see inside of it, too. The potato cannon is an extremely funny weapon that actually has a lot of really interesting effects. Like if you use a baked potato instead of regular potatoes, you get fire aspect on it, which is super cool. You can even turn it into a shotgun by using berries, as you can see. It has this like split spread effect like that. Crazy. And it sounds kind of satisfying to use. I mean, listen to that. Yeah. Thum. There's also the Wand of Symmetry, though the Wand of Symmetry messes with my head, although it probably is great for builders. You can set down the Symmetry thing, and it will actually like place items out of your inventory in a symmetrical pattern and break them as well. I I'm sure it is useful, but I don't have much of a mind for building, so... You know, I guess if you need to build something twice and exactly, the Wand of Symmetry is your friend. I don't know how to break it. How do you go away? Huh? What? Oh, wow. There. Oh, my. Wait, what? Whoa. Oh, I'm starting to see it. I didn't know you could do that. Okay. Yes. I love discovering things while recording a video. Sheep, you're messing with my symmetry, man. Well, I hope you found these things useful, especially if you're new and especially if you've been playing for a while. I love to help. I've got some other tutorials on the mod if you'd like to check out my channel. And as always, subscribe and uh, comment below how many of these that you already knew or how many you didn't.